This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study of God's word this morning, let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, we're thankful for your word, for what it reveals to us in terms of who you are, in terms of who we are, and that we may come to understand that the only path of life is the path that is in obedience to you, that we must come to understand that our basic orientation from our sin nature is to learn everything the hard way, to go it alone, to try to uh, live in what seems to be right to us. But as the writer of Proverbs tells us twice, there is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is death. So no matter how right things might seem to us in our experience or our reason, because those are both corrupted by sin, we must go to your word for everlasting eternal truth. And we must recognize that it is only on the basis of the truth of your written word and the truth of the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can live lives where we have meaning, value, purpose, and real happiness, no matter what the circumstances may be. So, Father, as we continue our study in Proverbs, learning what it means to live well, to live skillfully, we pray that we might be responsive to the challenge to learn wisdom, to get wisdom, to get all that we can as quickly as we can because we never know what the future holds. And we pray that you would guide and direct us this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1, we continue our study this morning in what uh, many would say is one of the most practical books in the Scripture. We've taken a couple of lessons so far to look at the basic uh, structure, the basic uh, foundation of, of the book of Proverbs, that this was written originally as the guidance from a father to his son. So the original context has to do with parental instruction, parental instruction. So there's much here to uh, discover related to training within the home. Now, you may not be a place in your life where you have young children at home or even older children at home. Maybe you have grandchildren. Maybe you don't have any grandchildren. Nevertheless, the principles that are embedded in this book of Proverbs are principles that guide and direct each of us on how to live life well. That's basically the idea of wisdom, to live well in the terms of God's uh, understanding of what well is, to live a wise or skillful life on the basis of how God has uh, created things and God has designed things. The author is Solomon. I believe that many of these proverbs are proverbs that he learned from his father David, also uh, Solomon himself was a man of wisdom, gifted by God exceptionally. He was wiser uh, than any uh, human being, I think, probably in history because of divine uh, grace. We looked at the opening introduction, uh, the purpose for this uh, book given in verses 2 through 6, and that they're designed that a, so that a wise man will hear and increase learning. And there we run into a word that we'll see again and again as we go through Proverbs, that we are to listen attentively and respond obediently to what the Scripture says. These aren't really options. They are mandates as softly as they might be uh, given in some places. A wise man will hear and increase learning. 
Learning is the foundation for growing. We live in an age today where we've had this information revolution over the last, not just with computers, especially with computers though, but really over the last 40 or 50 years, I think that all of the knowledge known in the human race up through about 1960 doubled again by 2000. It is beyond comprehension how, for any of our finite minds to grasp all that has been learned and discovered in just the course of our lifetimes. More has been learned, more has been discovered in the course of our lifetime than probably all of history up to that point. And that's just amazing. We also live in a time when at the, tu- at the touch of a few um, keys on the keyboard, we can access uh, incredible amounts of information. And by doing so, there's a deception that often takes place, a very subtle deception, and that is that we think that because we have access to a lot of information and facts, that we actually know something. But never be deceived, information is not knowledge, and knowledge is not wisdom. They are related. We have to have information in order to have knowledge, but information has to have comprehension. There has to be a framework that interconnects all of the bits and pieces of data in the information. It's not just random uh, pieces of information that are just free-floating out there uh, in the universe. They are connected, and the one thing that connects them ultimately from the biblical perspective is that they are all unified in the mind of God. Now, the only way we can discover that is through God's revelation. We can discover aspects of that unified knowledge as we look at different aspects of creation, but the only way we can uh, hope to put it all together is to come at it on the basis of the Word of God, God's revelation to us, because He gives us those critical pieces of information that we can't get through reason, we can't get through uh, our, our study and observation of creation. The only way to learn them is 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 through his word. So we get information, and then as we understand it within a comprehensive theory, uh, uh, we can then develop knowledge. But knowledge isn't necessarily wisdom. Knowledge is a comprehension of the facts, and as you and I both know, there are many facts about that t- Scripture teaches that we thoroughly understand, but we don't put it into practice very well. Wisdom is that uh, end result where we take knowledge and then we apply it to the issues of life, the decisions of life, and we create something of beauty and skill in our lives that is the result of the application of the truth, the doctrine, the teaching of the Word of God. And so the focal point in the introduction has to do with uh, the wise man, the person who would be wise, there's an embedded challenge there, uh, will hear and increase learning, constantly making that a priority. It's not something that uh, we do when we have time for it, but we understand that learning the Word of God is the ultimate priority and everything else in life needs to be arranged in a way that allows us to spend a maximum amount of time learning uh, the Word of God and learning about God, learning about us, and learning about God's plan for our lives. And then the second aspect of that couplet in verse 5, a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. So there's a movement there from hearing, increasing learning, that would be what I talked about with knowledge, and then understanding, that's the comprehension, and then attaining ultimately wise counsel. But the foundation, is we saw, was in verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And that is put there, and it's reiterated in the Psalms, it's reiterated later in Proverbs, to make us understand that if we do not begin life, begin our, our focus on life with the respect for the authority of God in our life, and we approach life on the basis of self-sufficiency and arrogance apart from God, then that leads to a path of self-destruction and a path of death. As we go through these 
Proverbs, we will see that there is a con- several contrasts made between the way of the wise, the way of the fool, the way of the wise, the way of the, sometimes he's referred to as the gullible one in some translations, or the naive. I like the idea of the person who's open-minded. And he's, because he's open-minded, he's sucked in all the garbage of the world, thinking, well, all truth is really the same, and he always leads to a path of self-destruction because there's no way of uh, self-correction in terms of what is right or what is wrong. It's a perfect picture of our modern, postmodern, American, Western, European culture that has rejected absolute truth, and they think they are so wise because they, they believe just about anything to be true, except, of course, the Bible. Except, of course, anything related to absolute, absolute truth. So it's a starting point is that respect for the authority of God, the sovereignty of God, that's the starting point of knowledge. And another way of talking about that is it's humility. It is uh, recognizing our limitations and that God and God alone has the right and the authority to address all of these issues of life. You can't learn anything in life unless you have humility. And humility comes a couple of different ways. It comes naturally. Some people uh, recognize in some areas of their life that they just don't know a whole lot and don't know much, and so they need to learn from someone. Others think that they already know it all, and they have to be humbled through some sort of enforced external um, event. And this comes as they, we face tragedy, as we face suffering, as we face certain uh, environments in life, whether it's in the classroom or in the, or in the family, let me say in terms of priority family, in the classroom, in the military, in, in, in a job environment. All of a sudden we learn we have to obey those who are in authority to get anywhere. And so that is related to this foundational principle of the fear of the Lord. But that idea of humility is really learned in the home and should be taught in the home. And that is one of the major uh, truths that we see in Proverbs. It's a home environment. It is the father instructing the son. And in that that event itself is embedded the idea that it's the role of the parents to train children and bring that discipline for learning into their environment. As a parent, your job is to enforce humility on your children. Now, I didn't say to humiliate them. I said to teach them humility so that they recognize uh, authority, when they're under authority, can learn to operate under authority and learn in an environment where hopefully they will not try to learn everything the hard way uh, some of us know that the only way we learn things is the hard way. Uh, many of us learn most of what we learn by the mistakes that we make. But we try to learn from others uh, through humility. And failure to uh, develop humility in life is just the path of destruction. So this is the focal point as we move out of the initial purpose statement of Proverbs 1 uh, one through seven into what is called the prologue. The prologue covers one eight down through the end of chapter nine. Uh, that is considered one large introduction to the rest of Proverbs. If you, starting with chapter ten, we see a series of what appear to be disconnected wise sayings. They may be uh, just one verse with two lines called a die stitch. In some places there's three lines, a tri stitch. In some place there may be two verses with two lines in each verse called a quadra stitch. And it is these, these groupings of verses that dominate the rest of Proverbs. But the first nine ch- chapters have a, have certain themes that run through them and that unify those chapters in terms of a, of a structured whole. And so it begins in verse 8, and this morning we'll just look at the, these two verses uh, at the opening, starting in verse 10, uh, through the end of the chapter and into the next, there's this contrast between the two paths that one can take in life, and the uh, instruction is focused to the son, 
as it states in verse 10, my son. And then the, the uh, focus is on handling temptation. And the temptation that comes especially to the youth, to the young, but also to uh, all of us at any age, how to handle temptation and what the enticements of temptation are. But we'll get to that uh, next week. In verse 8 and 9, we read, just a minute if I can get things up. Oh, not up and going yet. Had a couple of distractions this morning, so didn't get this going. In verse 8, we read, My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother. And then verse 9 gives us an explanation showing that 8 and 9 are really a quadra stitch. They are four lines related to each other. 4 introduces that explanation. For they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. So let's take a look at this particular verse. It begins with a line that we find 18 times in the first nine chapters, and that is the address to my son. We see it here in verse 8, we'll see it in verse 10, and we see it uh, 16 other times in the first nine chapters of the prologue. And then suddenly it drops out, and we don't run into it again until the 19th chapter, and there we're still in the initial grouping of Solomon's Proverbs, and again there is a number, a number uh, or eight more uses of the term my son. But it is this use, this term my son, that gives us an orientation to this as a family environment. Now, in the history of Israel, what happened is as this was written down in the context of family instruction, it was then taken and applied for others in the nation for, because Israel viewed a nation as a collection of tribes, the 12 tribes, and those tribes were made up of clans and families. And so uh, the family is fit within the totality of the nation. So if the nation was going to be successful, the family had to be successful. And for the family to be successful, then uh, there had to be a successful training regimen within the home. And once the home begins to break down, and that is the third divine institution, remember the first divine institution is human responsibility. Every individual is responsible to God for the choices they make, for the life they live. This is the first divine institution. Second divine institution is marriage. Marriage is between one man and one woman. Anything else leads to a breakdown of individual responsibility and a breakdown of the subsequent um, the subsequent divine institutions such as family. When you have the legitimization of homosexual marriage, it leads to the breakdown of, of the family as well. Um, homosexuality does not propagate, and so it leads to further uh, collapse and impacts the roles of men and women. And roles of men and women is a key theme in Scripture. God designed men with one role, women with another role. That doesn't mean they're not capable or competent in other areas. Uh, we live in an era today when there are many uh, single-parent homes, whether the father or whether the mother. And just because you're living in a single-parent home does not mean you can't take up the slack by God's grace for the parent that is missing. But the ideal standard is for a two-parent home, the father and the mother. And if you note, as we look at this particular uh, passage, that the uh, <clears throat> this uh, admonition in the first verse, my son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother. It places the authority of the father and the mother on equal footing as the those who are to instruct the child. And there are <clears throat> other passages that support that. 
Uh, my son is directed to the to the son, emphasizing that, and it would apply to daughters as well, to the children. But it is a indicates that this is a manual of home training for the Word of God. And then we have a parallel in the first verse. My son, hear the instruction of your father. But it is an antithetical parallel. Uh, do not forsake the law of your mother. So the first command is to listen. The second is a negative, don't forsake. So the command to hear, Shema, is a, <coughs> is a direct command that can be read as simply hearing, but it has the significance of listen with a view to obedience. Obey the instruction of your father would catch the meaning more precisely. This is, the, this is a common word in Hebrew, and it is <clears throat> uh, an idiom that is common to one we even use in English. When parents turn to their children and say, listen to me, they don't mean just pay attention to what I am saying in terms of letting your uh, eardrums be stimulated, but do what I'm telling you to do. That's what it means. So obey the instruction of the Father. And do not forsake, which is an, uh, cal imperfect, which in Hebrew grammar picks up the same uh, meaning of the previous verb. It carries it through. So it too should be understood as, a, as an imperative, as a command. Do not forsake. And the word there, Natasha, has that idea of rejecting something or casting it away or abandoning it as if it is worthless. So you're, on the one hand, obey the instruction of your father. On the other, don't abandon the law of your mother. So you, you have the uh, to focus on both father and mother, that the child is to listen, uh, listen to both. Then the next thing we see is that there is a, <clears throat> a syn- synonymous parallelism between the content of the father's teaching and the mother and this is indicated in the two words instruction and law. The word for instruction is one that we saw earlier in the third verse as well as in the um, uh, as well as in the seventh verse, fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's the Hebrew word musar, which means a disciplined uh, education. It involves rigor, it involves Uh, correction, and it involves rebuke. This is an idea that just runs counter to some of the uh, pedagogical theories popular in education in this country. We've all heard about the self-esteem movements in uh, education in California, different ideas that, well, there really shouldn't be any winners or losers in uh, Little League baseball or football. It's bad for their self-esteem to lose. No, it's good for their self-esteem. They're going to learn how to handle failure in life at a young age because everybody goes through uh, times of failure as well as times of success, and we often learn more from failure than we do from success. So instruction has that idea of a disciplined approach to learning and education, and it involves correction as well as rebuke. Whereas the parallel to that term in the second line is uh, the law, the term law of your mother. And this is not law in the sense of a codified law. This is law in the sense of instruction. That's the basic meaning of the Hebrew word Torah. It means instruction. And as such, it comes to have other shades of meaning, other nuances, one of which is law. And it's, some, and it's often translated that, but it really has the idea of, of a certain kind of instruction, instruction on how to live, how to live well, and it has the idea of an organized, structured um, a plan of, uh, of instruction. And so the son is, is exhorted at the beginning to be obedient. This is enforced humility. Listen to your parents. Do what they say. Uh, follow their instruction. But on the other hand, it tells you as parents that you need to have a plan of action because it is your responsibility to take that brand new baby 
and to train and discipline and prepare that baby so that when they reach adulthood and maturity, they can live life well. And this is not something you can delegate to the public schools, the private schools, or to Sunday school or prep school. This is your responsibility. And the most important thing that we note here is the priority of the role of the father. Now, it's a joint task. I'm not saying it's all the father. It's a joint task. Father and mother are viewed as a unit here, but the mother does not have a separate game plan. She follows the lead of the father. So again, it emphasizes the uh, authority and the leadership of the father uh, within the home. But it points out the fact that for a child to live, grow up to be adult, an adult that lives well, that has wisdom, then that is grounded in learning humility from an early age, and this means respecting the authority of parents. We look around our culture today, we see a tremendous uh, pattern of a lack of respect for authority. People don't understand what it means to honor and value authority. People want to live their life uh, just like the period of the judges. They want to do what's right in their own eyes and damn everything else. They don't want to listen to any authority. They can't submit to authority, and they're going to do whatever they want to do. But the Bible emphasized how important it was to learn authority inside the home. In fact, within the Mosaic Law, there were some pretty extreme punishments laid out for children who did not learn the lesson of obeying and honoring their parents. For example, in Exodus 21.15 and verse 17, we're told, first of all, he who strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. That was a capital crime. And they were to be executed. Uh, with, there were to be witnesses that were brought forth. There would be a public trial. And then they were to be taken out and executed in the public square. This would certainly be a warning to all of the other uh, juvenile delinquents that they better obey their parents. Or the community would bring them up on charges and they would be removed. Now, why in the world would the Bible say that? Because if it's... A, a, this this lack of authority orientation spreads like a virus throughout the community, throughout the culture. And we've seen that especially in the baby boom generation that was born between uh, j- about January the 5th or 6th of 1946, and I believe it ended in 1963. It's measured by an increased birth rate. And if you ever see the charts on the birth rate in uh, Western Europe in the United States, uh, ex- nine months to the day after the end of World War II, uh, the, the birth rate chart goes along at a regular rate, and then it just goes straight up, perpendicular. At, at nine months to the day after the end of World War II, there was quite a lot of celebration on May the 5th <laughs> on VE Day. And then it stays high like that until sometime in 1963, and it drops like a rock. And so that's why it's called baby boomers, because there's this boom in bursts that lasted uh, for about 16 or 17 years. Now, one of the problems with that generation, I always see the irony of it. We see people think about, well, we need to go back to those wonderful television programs like they had in the 50s that taught absolutes and taught morals. Well, they didn't do any good for the baby boomers, did they? Baby boomers didn't learn a thing from them. They didn't learn anything about authority orientation. They didn't learn anything about humility. They were such a powerful, dominant generation that whatever they wanted changed the world and changed the market. When uh, Disney released uh, uh, the the uh, Davy Crockett series with Fess Parker and Buddy Epson, immediately every little boy in, and probably a lot of girls in the United States wanted a coonskin cap, and the price of coonskin went from about 50 cents a pelt to about $5, $10 a pelt, and... Um, and it changed the whole market. Same thing happened when uh, Whammo came out with hula hoops. And when that fa- fad ended, uh, Whammo was left with 
warehouses and warehouses of hula hoops. But the, the, the wishes and desires of the baby boomers change the market. They're going to do it again as we go into retirement. And it's going to change the whole retirement nursing home industry, some for good, some not. But what this taught the baby boomers was what, that what they wanted, they got. And it developed a culture of narcissism, as Christopher Lash titled his book back in the 80s, that uh, continues to shape the thinking of America. So when you have a generation of narcissists, and they're narcissists because they lack authority orientation, then it bodes no nothing good for the culture. And that's exactly what's happened. But if you were to have to remove those who are rebellious, those who... Um, fail to honor their parents, then it would certainly teach a lesson to everyone else. And this is what the background for these verses. This is not because God is exceptionally harsh. It is because he recognizes that once you let this, this cancer, this virus of uh, lack of authority orientation to enter into the culture, it destroys the culture. So the uh, child who would strike his father or mother should be put to death. The one who cursed his father or mother uh, should be tr- should be uh, put to death. This is the idea of treating them with disrespect. So uh, this isn't just back talking once or twice. This is turning into a first class juvenile delinquent that completely rejects the authority of the parents. And then Leviticus nineteen thirteen, talking again. Everyone should <coughs> of you should revere or honor his father and mother and keep my Sabbaths. This is foundational. Deuteronomy 21, 18 um, and following down to 21 also emphasizes the fact that if uh, you have a child that is rebellious, they should be tried with witnesses, and then if they're guilty, taken out into the public square and stoned. This is foundational. Another thing we see in the instruction here that's embedded here is that there is a recognition of both the authority of the father and the mother, but there is a chain of command even within the home. We see that there's a chain of command, and we've studied this in the past, even in the Trinity. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.3 reiterates this, the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Everybody is under authority. It doesn't have anything to do with sin. It has to do with order and structure and accomplishing uh, the task. So the child is exhorted, challenged, listen to the disciplined uh, instruction curriculum from your father and do not abandon or disregard or treat lightly the law, the instruction of your mother. Why? Why should we listen? That's verse 9. For they, that is uh, the instruction of your father and the law of your mother, They will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. Now, what in the world is this all about? This imagery that we have here, graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. Well, the ornament on your head should be understood to be something akin to a wreath, such as was common. Not We usually think of a Greco-Roman uh, Olympic contest where if they uh, won, they were given the victor's wreath. But that did not begin with Rome. It did not begin with Greece. It has its roots going back into uh, sort of the foggy days of antiquity. The Egyptians had that practice. And to honor those who were victors in athletic contests or in battle, uh, they would be given a wreath. They would take branches of different uh, plants, weave them together, and make a wreath. This was a sign of something that what, that they had had victory over and that they, they had accomplished something. These were uh, symbols of honor and life. The same is true about the chains about the neck. These were chains, medals, medallions that were worn about the neck as a symbol of accomplishment, a symbol of, of a victory. So a few things about this I think are, are very, very instructive and help us to understand it a little bit. 
in this metaphor of using the wreath and the chains, the necklace around the neck, as it's being used as a symbol to communicate something about reality and to communicate biblical truth. In this kind of a metaphor, a known cultural object is taken, such as a victor's wreath, and it is used to transfer our understanding from something known to something unknown in terms of having spiritual victory or spiritual accomplishments in the battle, in the contest, in the struggle of our spiritual growth, in the uh, pattern of growing and uh, defeating the human viewpoint, cosmic thinking, a worldly thinking that is in our soul, and replacing it with divine viewpoint uh, thinking. The awarding of the wreath indicated a victory in an athletic contest or in battle, so that as the person wore it, uh, you recognize they were given a certain amount of prestige and honor. Sometimes they were given certain positions in society and recognition of accomplishment. In Egyptian culture, uh, there was a particularly interesting parallel Uh, One of the goddesses in the Egyptian pantheon is known as Ma'at. Uh, Ma'at is the Egyptian goddess of truth and justice, balance, uh, law, and order. And she's parallel to the Hebrew concept of chokmah, or wisdom. You see one depiction of her on the left, another on the right, and in between would be a cartouche or a necklace that would be given to someone recognizing that they have achieved a life that was reflective of justice and truth. Truth would be one of the main uh, (coughs) terms associated with Ma'at. She is portrayed in... um, in Egyptian literature as one who distributed wreaths or rewards in the realm of the dead for accomplishments and valor. But in contrast to that Egyptian idea, and remember all other pagan pagan culture practices are usually some sort of diluted or pale reflection of an original biblical truth, uh, in the Hebrew perception, uh, there <coughs> this occurred in life, And children would be given uh, awards uh, who honor their parents with obedience. That's the idea in Proverbs, is that if you're a young child and you're learning these lessons and you learn wisdom, then this will be a... Like a, like a garland around your head, this will be a sign of your victory over the challenges of life. And so Hebrew perception was that children who honored their parents and learned wisdom and applied it in their life, that that wisdom in their life was a symbol of victory in their life. Now, another aspect of Ma'at was that <clears throat> she was also... Uh, considered the goddess of life. And so there is an element of eternal life that is associated uh, with her as well, that if one mastered uh, the uh, wisdom, the truth of Ma'at, then there was the promise and the hope of, of life. Now this applied not only to uh, the wreath, but also to the uh, a chain or a medallion or cartouche worn around the necks, the, the neck. Egyptian officials and government leaders wore these chains around their necks as symbols of their exemplary lives in the service of Ma'at, the goddess of truth and order. So that in Egyptian literature, Ma'at, who is the goddess of truth or wisdom, was sometimes simply referred to as the necklace or the splendid chain about the neck of the chief justice. These would simply be uh, circumlocutions or idioms. Instead of mentioning her name, she would simply be referred to as, as the necklace. So the necklace is a sign of protection. And that's the idea here in this verse, that uh, if you listen to the instruction of your father, the law of your mother, then this ornament about your uh, head, the wreath about your head, or the chain about your neck, is a sign that this is protecting you. 
the truth of Ma'at, and symbolized by the cartouche, her truth, her justice, that was a sign of protection. So this is the idea, and it certainly fits the context of Proverbs. Now remember, I'm not saying that Solomon got the idea from the Egyptians, but what we find in the Egyptian culture is a pale reflection of a previously known truth revealed through through the scripture and that's the metaphor here it would it ran through all of the middle eastern cultures and so the the we're understanding the metaphor that this idea of wearing the wreath or having the chain is related to protection and also a reward for accomplishment protection works well in these opening chapters of proverbs proverbs 2 8 says uh, he guards the path of justice and preserves the way of the saints. If you learn wisdom, wisdom guards and protects you. Uh, Proverbs 2.11 says, Discretion will preserve you, and understanding will keep you. So if you learn the Word of God, you learn the truth, then it preserves and keeps you. Uh, verse 3, Proverbs 3.3 3 says, Let not mercy and truth forsake you, Bind them around your neck. See, there's that same imagery of a necklace again. Bind mercy and truth around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And then as you go on to read, it brings in the ideas of protection and preservation as well. Proverbs 4, 6, Do not forsake her, that is wisdom, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. So these terms indicate that if you learn the word, and you apply it, then it preserves and protects you from making foolish, bad choices and bad decisions. That verse from Proverbs 3.3 3 is central here. We see the combination of two key ideas, mercy and truth. Frequently, these words are joined together uh, in, uh, in the Scriptures. They are used a number of times together, and uh, only rarely apart. They go together. The word truth is the word emmet, which doesn't always mean truth in the sense of abstract truth, which we think of. Often it has the idea of that which never changes, that which is stable, that which is uh, 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 unchanging, and, is, and sometimes it relates to faithfulness and dependability. A form of that word, a noun form of that word, was used to describe the foundation stones under, Sol under the pillars in Solomon's temple. Now, they're not like the foundation stones that some of us have seen. We've gone to Israel. You go down along the uh, uh, western wall, you see these huge foundation stones that were placed there uh, by Herod. Uh, they weigh in excess of 450 tons. And we're moved there now. That, but that relates. That's the idea there. It's something that is so massive, so solid, it's unshakable. Truth is unshakable because it is eternal. So they, it comes to mean I, reliability, security, uh, faithfulness, and truth. The other word is mercy, which is the Hebrew word chesed, which refers to God's faithful, loyal uh, love and emphasizes the rock-solid character of God and His grace. Scripture emphasizes this significance of truth, a concept that is often derided in our culture because people don't want to believe in an absolute truth. You have your truth, I have my truth. You go do your thing, I'll do my thing, and uh, we'll both live happy lives. But the Bible sees an absolute eternal truth that is outside of our experience. Psalm 119 uh, has several verses related to truth and the Word of God. Uh, Psalm 119.43, Take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances. The word of God is the word of truth. The law of God is the word of truth. Psalm 119.142, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. We see another important aspect here, that truth is often related to righteousness. You can't have righteousness without truth, and you can't have truth without righteousness. Tzedek and truth go hand in hand. Psalm 119, 151, You are near, O Lord, you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Psalm 119, 160, The entirety of your word is truth. 
Not a little bit, but all of it. We have certain injunctions related to the priority of truth. Proverbs 23.23 says to buy the truth and do not sell it. It is more important than anything that you can come up with. Buy the truth, do not sell it. Also, and then the verbs left out, but it's implied, also by wisdom and instruction and understanding. Uh, truth, as I just pointed out, is seen as the foundation for righteous deeds, for tzedek. He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness declares deceit. Proverbs 14.22 says, they, Do they not go astray who devise evil? But mercy and truth, they go together, belong to those who devise good. Truth is also the foundation for good government, mercy and truth. Proverbs 20, 28, mercy and truth preserve the king, and by loving kindness, he upholds his throne. Proverbs 29, 14 says, the king who judges the poor with truth, the king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. It is not the king who makes truth. Truth is something that precedes and rules over the king. And then finally in Proverbs 16:6, 6, in mercy and truth, atonement, that is cleansing, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. Taking us back to the key principle of 1-7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And this begins with recognizing atonement, the cleansing from sin. Jesus Christ came to die for sin. That's the starting point for you. If you've never trusted Christ as Savior, that's where you start. If you have, we go back to the principles of cleansing in 1 John 1, 9 as a starting point that we must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and He is the one who exalts us. The issue, if you want to live well, and you want to live in a way that creates something of real beauty and value, then it starts with humility, recognition of the authority of God especially, and other realms of legitimate authority secondarily. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to study your word this morning, to be reminded of the importance of humility, that we need to submit to the authorities put over us, ultimately submit to your authority, that the fear of you is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Father, we pray that we might be worthy of this challenge to submit ourselves to you, to recognize that you determine the priorities for our lives and that we must make your word the highest priority. We must buy truth and sell it not. That nothing in our life is more significant, more valuable, of a of higher weight than that of knowing you and knowing your word. And if we sacrifice the knowledge of you, the knowledge of your word, for jobs, education, fun, social life, whatever it may be, then we are mortgaging and destroying our future. We need to make the study of your word the highest priority in our life. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here who is unsure of their salvation or uncertain of their eternal destiny, that they would take this opportunity to make that both sure and certain. For you, the issue is not truth in the sense of truth for spiritual growth and spiritual life. It is truth related to the good news of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sin, and that by simply accepting it, believing in him, trusting in him and him alone, you will be given eternal life which will never be taken from you, and then the next decision is going to be what are you going to do with that new life? Are you going to waste it, or are you going to make it a priority? That is the challenge before us. Father, we pray that we might be worthy of this challenge, and that God the Holy Spirit would strengthen us as we pursue spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand for our closing hymn, number 66, To God Be the Glory. And I'm going to ask Doug Carn if he would please come up to dismiss us in closing prayer. Please stand.
Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your incredible grace gift of your word. We thank you for the opportunity and a prepared pastor to take in your word. Father, we pray for those who could not be with us this morning due to physical ailments or illness. We pray that you'll give them health and strength and make them a testimony to all those around them. Father, we pray that you'll challenge us with the things we've heard this morning and give us uh, safety as we return to our homes. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.